A time for renewal. A time to get out on the road and enjoy this great country of ours. And for thousands of American Truck Historical Society members, a time to gather together and celebrate the history of trucks, the trucking industry, and its pioneers. ATHS was founded on March 24, 1971, and incorporated in the state of Its charter meeting was held in Chicago on May 6, 1971. ATHS's first convention took place in 1972, but it wasn't until 1980 at the ATHS convention in Sarasota, Florida, that an antique truck show became a part of the annual festivities. Each year, ATHS's annual conventions are held in a special corner of the United States, each with its own unique flavor and color. In 1991, Marlboro, Massachusetts was the site of a gathering of over 600 trucks, including an indoor exhibit of some rare East Coast iron. In 1992, Portland, Oregon hosted ATHS on the shores of the Columbia River, where conventioneers were treated to an exceptional gathering of great Northwest heavy haulers and a welcoming show from Portland's fireboats. The 1993 ATHS convention and antique truck show was held in Milwaukee, a city of 1.4 million, famous for its beer, but this largest city in Wisconsin and leading Great Lakes port is also an industrial center. So it was appropriate that on May 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th, 1993, this colorful city and the Beer City chapter of ATHS play host to the 22nd annual ATHS convention. Held at the Grand Milwaukee Hotel, the ATHS convention included the 14th annual Antique Truck Show, which treated the 1,000 conventioneers and many thousands of visitors to one of the greatest gatherings of Wisconsin manufactured trucks ever assembled in one place. We were fortunate to have the opportunity to speak with Bart Rawson of the Philadelphia chapter. Mr. Rawson joined ATHS in 1974 as managing director. He later became editor of ATHS's newsletter and was instrumental in converting the newsletter to ATHS's magazine, Wheels of Time. I'm Bart Rawson, uh, involved with the society from way back in the beginning. And I think maybe they, as a starting point, we ought to mention that in 1974, we had 250 members. And today we have 15,500. So that shows the kind of growth that we've had in those roughly 20 years. Here we are today at the start of the, one of our biggest truck shows. There are over 400 trucks here. And it was suggested I might go back to the fact that we had a lot of conventions without any trucks at all. And then we decided to bring in the hardware and that started things going in a big way. As I say, now we have 400 trucks here and uh, this is one of our biggest, it is not the biggest. And one of the most interesting things I think about all the trucks here are the fact that they are so varied. Unlike an automobile show, they start with little bitty trucks and they go on to great big trucks and in between are all matter of things and some of them are not even restored. And the restored ones, of course, are absolutely magnificently done. There was also an assortment of indoor displays to tempt any conventioneer looking for the ideal keepsake. But outside was where the real excitement was as hundreds of beautiful trucks from across North America were on display. We caught up with Larry Sheaf, the present managing director of ATHS. We're here today taking part in the 22nd annual convention of the American Truck Historical Society. We're in Milwaukee. Each year we go to a different third of the country, uh, east, west, central, and so forth. And next year we'll be in Buffalo, the following year in Spokane, then Toledo, and so forth. But the point is that we like to show these trucks off to the public. Our uh, members take part in the activity. Today we expect in excess of 450 trucks at this show. You'll be able to see examples of what's here in uh, the rest of the video. All of our members enjoy the camaraderie that they find when they come to this show and uh, look forward to it each year. Don Botts of the Beer City chapter of the ATHS was this year's truck show chairman. He was also showing off his 1931 one and a half ton Chevy steak truck.
built right down the street. You're looking at a beautiful 1931 Chevrolet ton and a half steak truck. It was originally purchased by a firm right here in Milwaukee. It was manufactured in Janesville. Gesundheit. We first owned it in 1967, sold it in 1974, relocated it again in 1983. However, the price was a little too high, so we couldn't afford to buy it back. I purchased it finally in 1986. We worked on it for two years, had it roadworthy in 1988. We've been in the Great Milwaukee Circus Parade every year since. We were also selected by our local chapter to be the feature truck of this national show. And needless to say, we're quite proud of it. We spoke with Dale Anderson of the Hartford, Wisconsin Heritage Auto Museum, one of the area's attractions, about his very rare Wisconsin manufactured Kissel and its home at the museum. Today we brought in our 1923 Kissel one and a half ton truck. Uh, now this vehicle was originally purchased by a married lady in Denver, Colorado in 1923, paid cash for it. Uh, we have it documented because we have the original title. Uh, along with the title was the original uh, business card from the salesman that sold her the vehicle. The vehicle is one of many that are held at the Hartford Heritage Auto Museum at Hartford, Wisconsin. Uh, Hartford was the home of the Kissel Automobile Car Company, and uh, they were in business from 1906 through 1931. Uh, during their course of time, they made uh, 35,000 cars, trucks, ambulances, hearses, taxi cabs, and fire engines. Uh, out of the total uh, production, uh, there's approximately 70 Kissels that are left in the world of any type. Uh, at the present time, we normally have about 15 uh, Kissels on display, and of course, we have many other vehicles uh, besides. Kissel. Along with the many Wisconsin built rigs on hand for this year's show, there were some highly unusual one off trucks built for work and for fun. Such as this 1968 Brockway that says a lot about its owner's other hobby. Richard D. Gamini, who built this Model T ready mix truck, told us about the birth of an industry. I took this restoration project on as a ready mix producer. Back in 84, 1984, I wanted to restore a vehicle equal to the oldest ready mix truck that I see by pictures. And it happened to be a Milwaukee contractor, uh, Jim Kalinske, he had three ready mix plants within the Milwaukee area. But what really made it famous, he took this idea out to Hoover Dam and poured all the tunnels with ready mix on wheels, which created the new ready mix industry with hauling trucks. And I restored this in the year of 1984, I started. I finished uh, late in 86 and put it for show like I've been showing since. And then I've restored two other units here next to me. And they were all affiliated with our business and the tied in with the ready mix industry. The owner of the Little Horses by Illions was busy when we stopped by. So, to the strains of its calliope, we decided to take a look around. And as with every ATHS truck show, military vehicles had a strong presence. Hi, I'm Tom Warren. I'm here standing in front of my 1942 Ford Dorco dual engine truck. It is a, uh, it has two complete drive trains, two flathead Fords, two uh, transmissions. Uh, they're Warner transmissions, standard trans off the shelf transmissions used by the Ford Motor Company and it has two rear axles. Each axle and transmission and engine are they're independent from the standpoint of their one engine drives, one transmission, one rear axle. In effect, you have two dual, uh, two trucks sitting beside in the same chassis. These trucks were built by E&L Transport Company in Dearborn, Michigan at the beginning of 
World War II to transport the famed B-24 bombers that were built at Willow Run to Tulsa, Oklahoma, Fort Worth, and San Diego, California from the Willow Run plant. Uh, this particular truck was found in Texas, some south, uh, some 90 miles south and west of Amarillo, Texas. In the fall of 1989, it was restored from May of uh, 1992 through this May of 1993, and we're glad to have it here at uh, the ATHS meet in Milwaukee. My name is Jack Thomas. I'm from Bossier City, Louisiana. And this is my 1952 white WC-22 PLT. And this truck was originally a military vehicle and it was uh, owned by the Army. And it was used on a flight line to haul a fuel tanker to fuel up the aircraft. And uh, after a stint of about 15 years from there, it went up to the uh, forest of Colorado where it hauled a water tanker and uh, it hauled a water tanker for about 20 years and then I bought the truck about eight years ago from a used equipment dealer in uh, Rolla, Missouri. And uh, I started working on the truck at that time and uh, between myself and my son-in-law, we got it done and uh, I've had it for two different shows. I've had it to Denver, Colorado and uh, we hauled it up here on uh, a B61 Mac that I own and uh, it's just a, just a real enjoyable hobby. It's a family-oriented hobby, and uh, we have a real good time playing with the old trucks. Karen and Larry Felly of Lena, Illinois, brought their 1950 Rio Wrecker. Uh, hello, my name is Karen Felly, and this is my husband, Larry Felly. This is a 1950 Rio E21 gold, with a Gold Comet motor. We found it in Astico, Wisconsin. My husband's cousin, Jeffrey, is a truck driver. and happened to be driving by and found it. Uh, we're in the towing business, and we always like tow trucks. So we've got this one, which started our collection. We have a few other Rios at home that we're in the process of working on. Although they were never built in Wisconsin, Diamond Tees have crisscrossed the state and the country since the first one rolled off the assembly line in Chicago, Illinois, back in 1911. spoke with a number of Diamond T owners, including ATHS guest speaker John Everett, who, although he spoke of trucks manufactured in Wisconsin, brought along an outstanding Diamond T 412DR with a 20-foot Fruhoff trailer. Its unique lubrication setup has kept it running all these years. Well, my name's John Everett from Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, and this is my 1936 model 412DR Diamond T. It's a 20,000 gross weight single axle semi tractor. It uh, features a Hercules 404 cubic inch WXLC3 engine, five speed transmission. In the back is my uh, 20 foot crew op semi trailer. It uh, used to belong to RV Cartage out of Chicago. They were the exclusive hauler for uh, Spiegel mail order catalog. This truck, as near as we know, it was. Uh, perhaps originally owned by Motor Transport of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And, uh, I got it about 11 years ago. It took approximately nine years to restore. But, uh, no stone was unturned in the restoration. Makes a nice rolling tribute to the uh, early days of the motor carrier industry, you know, which, for better or worse, has uh, given us our modern consumer society. You know, you want what you want when you want it. And uh, of course, motor trucks are uh, how we get our groceries and clothes and necessities of life. 
So it makes a nice rolling tribute to those guys that uh, earned their living the hard way. But, uh, anybody that was old enough to have driven this thing when it was new would have to be 90 years old nowadays. You know, there's many gadgets that uh, are available for vehicles, but this is a one that's particularly beneficial. It uh, provides a uh, lubricating and uh, cleaning mist of uh, oil for the intake valves and uh, it percolates with manifold vacuum and then it draws the mist into the manifold and from there it cleans the intake valves and uh, keeps the valve guides lubricated. It also has a uh, oil cooler built right in here. It's a, where the, every gallon of water passes through a little uh, brass radiator core through which the lubricating oil circulates. So it keeps the oil cool, clean. It's a little bit ahead of its time. Nate Hare, president of the Southern Wisconsin chapter of ATHS, drove his beautiful high binder to the show. My, my name's Nate Hare. I'm from Lena, Illinois. I've been a member of the ATHS for since 1982. I'm president of our Southern Wisconsin chapter. I have a 1955 International High Binder with a 1951 through off stainless steel trailer. I restored this trailer back in uh, 88 and been to uh, the ATS shows in Ontario, California, Denver, Colorado, and Portland, Oregon. This truck was really pretty good shape when I got it and took us only about a year to restore it. We enjoy it. We take a lot of shows around the Midwest and all over. And speaking of internationals, Ken Rabinek came up from Louisville, Kentucky in his C1 pickup. I'm Ken Rabinek. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. This is a 1936 C1 international pickup truck. I believe it was a farm truck up in Ohio, and I bought it at an auction in Louisville. And it was a little on the rough side, so I had a love for international trucks. I used to drive one as a kid. And when I saw this one at the auction, I wanted to go and do something with it to rebuild it. So I tore this completely down, took me four and a half years, and this is the results of it. I just finished it last week to get it ready for this show. The 1993 ATHS Antique Truck Show was a feast for truck lovers with a tremendous assortment of marks and setups. We'd need days to show you all of them, but here's a quick look around at some of our favorites.
The stars of this year's show were the Wisconsin-built machines. And right now, we're going to show you some of the best examples of the trucks that made Wisconsin famous. Hi, I'm Lloyd Van Horn, Van Horn's Truck Museum, Mason City, Iowa. I brought up three Wisconsin-built trucks for the show this weekend. The first one being the Oneida. That was built in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And the uh, unusual thing about it, it was built for World War I use and never used. When the truck was uh, finally sold to the public, it had 33 miles on it. So it's probably about the newest old truck you're ever going to see. Those side curtains had never been down. Going on to the Sternberg, that was built in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, this particular truck uh, ran 33 years without a major overhaul. Uh, then it was taken to the Sterling factory. Uh, they changed the name during World War I from, Sterling, from Sternberg to Sterling. And uh, an interesting thing, the Ernest Sternberg, the son of the founder of the company, is here at the show. He's 76 years old, and we gave him a ride in this truck yesterday. And uh, he really enjoyed that. It was really something, after all those years, uh, to get a ride in a truck that uh, his father built. Built it the same year he was born, in fact. Uh, it's all Sternberg parts. They built their own components, their own motor, their own transmission rear end. Most trucks back then were assembled trucks. You bought from a certain company, boot engines and so forth, but Sternberg built their own. Getting on to the Samson, that was built, that was built in uh, Janesville, Wisconsin, and uh, General Motors built that truck, and they built it to compete with the Model T. They built Samson trucks and Samson tractors to compete with the Fortson and the T. Uh, it wasn't too successful, and the company lasted about four years. My name is Gilbert Burmaster, and I was born and raised in Loganville, Wisconsin. And I am the owner of this 1929 Klondike truck, which was built in Loganville, and they only built 27 of them. It was short-lived company and they had a six-cylinder Wisconsin type Y engine, a Browning transmission, and a Wisconsin rear end which were all manufactured here in Milwaukee. And they had a special brake system with two hand brakes besides the foot brake and they used to travel about 50 miles an hour with these things when they got them rolling. And the wooden cabs were manufactured uptown by a wagon shop up in the village of Loganville. And my father was employed at this company factory where they made this truck, and this was the last truck. And it's the only known Klondike to exist that we know of as today. I'm Gary Keelish from the Nash Car Club of America, and I brought to the show this unique Nash pickup truck, which is owned by Jim Dworshak, the founder of the Nash Car Club of America. This truck was produced at the factory as a limited production model. Uh, they may have made 10, nobody really knows. This exact truck was used at the factory at the Seaman Body Plant in Milwaukee for deliveries around town, pickups around town, a general purpose used truck. It served many years. I don't know when they stopped using it. It was in the 70s when it, when it became available to public, private purchase. Um, it has then been completely restored as from being a work truck, it was pretty well uh, beat up. Um, the owner has gone through it extensively, uh, complete frame-up restoration. It was rather easy in some respects as what Nash did was use the Nash Ambassador automobile frame and front sheet metal. Basically is much like a car from the middle of the roof forward. It has a aftermarket purchased Knox box, I believe, that the factory purchased for this truck to have a ready-made box to put on it. They incorporated the rear fenders from the automobile and the engine, transmission, and running gear is all from the automobile, so it was not that difficult to restore. It was originally the red truck. The painting on the side is duplicated from original photographs. Nash never went into production on the pickup trucks. They did make a prototype in 42, which has been restored by another member of the Nash Car Club of America. Um, the 42 pickup truck 
was, re, was kept by the factory for many years and updated as new styles and they used it for uh, prototyping newer styles also, which never went into production. Nash did make big semi-truck, uh, medium-duty trucks, many of which were used as uh, wreckers for the dealers, and uh, dump trucks and that, and this cab is the same as used on the big dump trucks that Nash made. Over here we have the Nash Quad. These became very popular in World War I in, and in the uh, Mexican-American War, General Pershing used these trucks. I don't know too much about them exactly as it's a little older than I can remember. They were made in Wisconsin. They're a Wisconsin-built vehicle. I'm John Secord from West Bend, Wisconsin, and this is a pair of 1947 Sterling plow trucks. They're Cummins diesel-powered, uh, the model is DD-145, and uh, this one is owned by uh, Greg Rudolph. It's um, serial number 612. This one is uh, uh, serial number 604, and I have serial number 601 at home. These trucks were built in Wisconsin. They're uh, the... Uh, uh, direct descendants of the Sternberg truck that's uh, elsewhere in the video and uh, they have Cummins diesel engines and Timken axles. And Kenworth owners were well represented. Larry Caves 1954 conventional has an option anyone who has hauled through the high country in winter will appreciate. This is a 1954 Kenworth conventional. The unique thing about it is it's got a set of Elston sanders on it. These sanders were used when the roads were bad out in the mountains, it electrically operated from within the cab. The driver could let sand come out onto the ground to give him braking and pulling power when the, when the roads were bad. We have behind it a 1951 true off van trailer, which was basically hooked up with this tractor as a combination. Although Saturday was a picture perfect day, on Sunday, the Wisconsin skies opened. But even heavy rain could not put a damper on this year's show.
Dawson spoke of ATHS's efforts to preserve automotive history. I would like finally to, to point out just one special thing is that while we do have all these antique trucks, we also like to emphasize the fact that our name is the American Truck Historical Society. And uh, in that phase, we also try to really preserve the history of this great industry of ours. And yesterday at, uh, at our session, we had four magnificent talks at a so-called meeting in the a business meeting in the hotel and we learned the history of several different companies and you put those all together and you really come up with a, a tremendous background of how this trucking whole industry started basically back to about 1910 before it got really going and it's been growing ever since and it will continue to grow. Those magnificent talks included presentations given by Jack Schwarman on the Schwarman Motor Service, Ivan Baxter on Waukesha Engine Research, Clarence Jungworth on the history of Oshkosh, and John Everett on trucks manufactured in Wisconsin. Now, here are some highlights of three of those talks. The logo of the Oshkosh Truck Corporation. They were known as the Hemets and nicknamed the Ships of the Desert. In 100 hours, the war was over with the Iraq army in full retreat. The Tamets had played a significant part in this victory. It was a fitting tribute to the quality product built by a company that had a start in its very humble beginnings in the small community of Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Two patents were the foundation of our company and this is the steering mechanism that's based upon a principle still used today on the front axles. The other patent was an, auto, on an automatic locking differential used in a transfer case. And the story of how that automatic locking differential became is very interesting. Mr. Besterdick and Otto Zakow worked for the FWD company in, in Clintonville. And one day they had a touring car, a new touring car, and it, it was only a rear drive, and they took it out for a drive. And they got stuck in the sandy loam soils around Clintonville, and they couldn't get it out. And they tried hard, and finally Mr. Vesevic and Zacho got the idea of having two guys to pull on the front wheels and tires of the, motor, of the car. And they found when they gunned the vehicle and had two people pushing on the front wheels of that car, and he got it out of the sand in, in a matter of moments. And when they went back home that evening, they discussed the ease with which that vehicle came out of the sandy ground. And from that became the development, of, they finally developed the principle of the four-wheel drive. And that's the birth of the principle that makes the heavy-duty vehicles you see today really possible. And you have to remember that this uh, drive was in the days when there was no paved roads and most of the roads are unimproved. And I'm sure you're aware of the pictures of the roads in those days in the 20s and 30s and then sometimes only horses could get through. But the four-wheel drive principle really gave the truck industry a big start. The land called Wisconsin lies within these borders, these borders that are known as the Cheddar Curtain. In 1873, a clergyman and physician named Dr. Carhart built a light steam-powered buggy and drove it on the streets of Racine. In 1875, his success inspired the state legislature to post a $10,000 prize for any vehicle that could traverse the 200 miles from Green Bay to Madison at an average speed of five miles an hour. Perhaps it was for this competition that William Sternberg, uh, William Sternberg Sr. of Sterling fame, built his steam wagon in that same year. Vehicle technology was moving ahead, but the roads of Wisconsin were impassable six months out of the year. A given stretch of road may be clear for most of its length, but one snowdrift, mud hole, or steep grade can render its whole length useless. The dairy farm and dairy industry were especially dependent on regular pickups and deliveries year-round, and bad roads were proven costly. 
It's now the turn of the century in Milwaukee, and the companies whose names are now household words are in full swing or just starting up. Like this picture of Alice Chalmers, Harnish Fager, Fairbanks Morse, Evan Rood, Harley Davidson, <laughs> Briggs and Stratton, Easy access to ice, grain, and wood for barrels made Milwaukee lager beer nationally famous. A smaller company called Johnson Service started building a line of trucks in 1901. Already a high technology company in their day, Johnson built trucks alongside their core business of heating controls and communication systems for large buildings. You get to where you're over 70, you begin to think, Boy, you know, the big worry I got is someday I might get Alzheimer's and nobody notice the difference. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first engine. That's the Waukesha Model A. And uh, that was produced uh, in a four cylinder model, four and a quarter bore, four and three quarter stroke, 269 cubic inches. They made 300 of those from the start of the very first run up until 1914. So they were in production for. 1907 to 14. You'll notice that's pretty rudimentary. It's got outdoor valve gear, outdoor camshaft, other gears. Waukesha has progressed. And this is a, an engine that was uh, pretty new at the time. I retired. And uh, it's a 16 cylinder, 9,390 cubic inch engine. And uh, it has an eight and a half inch stroke. And you can buy that at either a, an eight and a half four or a nine or a nine and three eighths, depending on the fuel. This is the reason that people don't know that Waukesha is still in business. They're out of the consumer products business now. These kites of engines, that one weighs about 19 tons in stock your feet, and you'll seldom find that in a home application. <laughs> The 1993 American Truck Historical Society Antique Truck Show. It was a time to remember. Now you've really seen them all. Oh, and one last thing. If you really love old trucks, blow your horn. Thanks for watching and please drive safely.